Okay, we are clicking all the things. All right, it has happened. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first episode of Beyond the Adventure. So this is a follow-up to other things you may have already seen broadcast from us here at the Field Museum. We've been doing the Discovery Adventure series where we're usually in the museum and talking about different topics. But we got so many awesome questions from our viewers during those productions that we decided to have more time just for Q&A. So these are kind of half hour time slots. We're going to hit those same topics, but we're here to hear from you and we would love to hear what your questions are. If you are joining us on Zoom, you have the ability to use the chat or the Q&A and send any questions to us throughout. And if you're watching from YouTube, um, that is awesome and it is harder to send us questions over there. So be sure to check us out on Zoom or to email us in advance if you wanna send your questions while you're watching on YouTube. Um, but today we're talking all about bats, my very favorite mammals. They're delightful. Um, they're the only group of mammals that can fly. We talked about them a lot in our episode a couple months ago, all about bats, but we are here today to answer some of the questions that are on your mind about these awesome animals. So, and I'm also, hello, I'm Anna. I work at the Field Museum <laughs> as an educator. And I'm joined here with Lauren. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> hi, Anna. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Wagner, and I'm the Learning Operations Coordinator here at the Field Museum. And Lauren's going to be going through anything you'd all type into the chat in the Q&A, and we'll be kind of reading all of our questions. So feel free to throw them at us, ask us anything about bats. And to get us started, do we have any kind of starter sampler questions about bats, Lauren? Can you talk a little bit about bat wings and how they kind of look like fingers? Yes. So bats are really unique because they are the only flying mammals. But like all mammals, they've got the same basic body plan and structure. So this is a model, this is a replica of a bat wing, which is the same as our arms, but also different. So. We've got like our nice humerus and our radius and ulna. And then these are the bat's fingers. So you can count them up just like our hand. There is one, two, three, four, and five with a little thumb there. So they do have five fingers just like us, but for a bat, the fingers are really, really long. And if you think about that, um, if you've ever eaten chicken wings or seen somebody else eat chicken wings, Birds have really weird arms and very tiny fingers that are not very present. Birds are able to fly because they have a really unique covering, those feathers. So feathers help birds to fly, but because bats do not have feathers, they need these super long fingers to build up their wing shape. So those are all connected when they are alive and not a skeleton with flaps of skin, which are about the same as our eyelids in thickness and texture. And that's called a patagium. That is how our little bat friends can fly. And this is much bigger than a bat that lives around here in the United States. This is from a gray-headed flying fox. Um, in the United States, our bats are much smaller, but this is just easier to see because it's really big. Anna, do you know how many different bat species are in Illinois? Do you have any examples of them? Yeah, let me, I do have one of them. So I am trying to remember the difference of the bats in Illinois versus Chicago, because I think there's five in Chicago, but there might be six or seven in Illinois. Um, but one of them is these ones right here. These are Eastern red bats, which are one of my favorite bats because they're very cute and orangey red. Um, and they are also, I think, really delightful because every bat has different strategies to survive. And one of these bat strategies to camouflage is they will hang from just one foot so that they are very accurately playing the role of a leaf. They're just miming a leaf and with their one foot, they're like, I'm not a bat, I'm a leaf. I only have one, one stem, see, I'm just a little dead leaf, which is super cute. Um, but you may have heard of a big brown or a little brown bat. Those are two other bats you can find in Chicago. We also have a silver haired bat and a hoary bat in the Chicago area. I 
I think there's other ones too throughout Illinois. And if I'm like making some guesses, like we're close to Indiana where there's also the Indiana bat. What does he, what do they feel like, Anna? I see that you're like They're touching super them. soft. They're incredibly soft. They're very, very fun to be able to pet because they have very soft fur to keep their tiny little bodies warm. I don't recommend petting a wild bat, but in the in the museum when we're open and when it's not a pandemic, there are some different hands-on learning experiences either on the carts that are out on the floor or in the science hub. So in the future, when we're allowed to touch objects again, talk to me and I will find a bat and you can pet a bat. because It's very nice to touch a bat, they're very soft. So the bats have the nice warm fur. Do they actually hibernate in the winter or do they fly around and we just don't see them because it's so dark? That's a great question. So they, they don't usually fly around looking for food in the winter because the bats that live around here all eat bugs and all the bugs are gone. They're usually underground hibernating, sleeping in like a life cycle that they're not out as well. So the bats have either already flown around and flown south and migrated, just like we see geese and other animals migrate, but some bats do hibernate. And they're finding that some bats maybe do a little bit of both. So the Eastern red bat, for example, um, they used to think was migratory and they still seems to be somewhat migratory, but they're finding that sometimes when they're doing like burns, controlled burns in the winter of leaf litter, that these bats are like emerging from the leaf litter and flying away. They're like, oh, there was a bat there. So they might be sometimes like sleeping in piles of leaves where before people were like, they're gone. They must have migrated. They apparently were just sleeping under our noses. So we're still learning new things about some different bat strategies to survive the winter. So when they hibernate in the leaf litter, they don't always just go in caves. They can be anywhere. They can. So they might be in your attic. <laughs> That does happen sometimes with people. Um, and caves are a really ideal hibernation location though for bats because it's incredibly temperature controlled. It's like a very stable environment and it's usually pretty safe from predators and the weather. So usually that is a go-to hibernation spot. We do have a question in the chat. This one's from Laura. Laura would like to know, can you talk a little bit more about the wide variety of bat foods like fishing bats? or pollinators? Yes, I love how many different bat foods there are. Bats can eat so many different things. So it's at first good to remember that there's just a lot of different kinds of bats. There's over 1,400 different bat species. And so among them, they've specialized to a lot of different foods. So around us in Illinois, we talked about how all the bats eat bugs, but in other parts of the world, there are bats that eat fish. They catch them with their feet. They can detect them with their echolocation and they'll scoop up and catch fish kind of like an eagle, but a bat, which is very cool. But there's bats that will drink blood like the vampire bats. Those are a real bat. There are bats that do eat fruit. I'll just like pop up a picture of a bat with a fruit because they're super cute. And there's bats that drink nectar from flowers, just like a bee, which is also super cute and then they get pollen all over their faces. But look at this like very happy little bat approaching a fruit, just like, yes, this is, will be delicious. Must eat the fruit. And what else? Some bats can eat scorpions. Some bats can even eat other bats. Look at this happy little fruit bat munching on a fruit. So there's, there's a bat for almost every type of food, I feel like, which is pretty cool. Do bats have any natural predators? Yes. So bats are nocturnal. So a lot of their predators are nocturnal or they're really active at dusk. So there's different birds that have specialized to hunt bats. So sometimes it could be more common owls and hawks that are just like, oh, look, a food, I will eat this food. But there's certain raptors that have specialized. There's a bat hawk and a bat falcon. They don't live around here. Um, they live in Africa and Central and South America, and they will specialize in waiting outside caves at dusk, and then they just fly around and eat as many bats as they can. There's also snakes that will lurk around outside bat emergent spots and eat bats that come out. So 
there's definitely predators that are like, everybody lives in this hole. They all come out at the same time. And that is when I have a buffet. Another question here from our audience. Can you tell us more about the white nose fungus? Is that ongoing or is it improving or is it getting worse? That is a great question. And I am not like the exactly most up to date. I am not actively researching white nose syndrome, but um, what I know about white nose syndrome, which is a fungus. Um, and if you've never heard of it before, what happened is it's a fungus that is found in Europe. And when it came to America, the bats here had no resistance to it. It doesn't make bats sick in Europe, but it's making the bats get sick here. And it wakes them up from their hibernation. Their body is like fighting off this fungus and they're like waking up in their hibernation and it like can be wearing away different parts of their body. But the biggest problem is it's using their energy and they're like waking up hungry and they need food and it's the middle of winter and there's no food. And so then they starve to death and it's very, very sad. What's also sad is because many bats are migratory they are carrying it. And so it's most bat to bat issue. There's bats that are spreading it to new locations where new bats are getting infected. And a lot of the migratory bats will survive because they're moving to places where they can always find food, but bats that are hibernating, that are staying in one place, they are not able to successfully hibernate. And so we're seeing places where 90 or more percent of the bats have died off, which is really, really extreme population loss. So that's not good. Um, we do, however, do see some bats surviving. Um, and I think there's still some concern that like if they get the fungus the next year, like they were able to survive it once, but it's still like can affect them the next year. I don't know if they're like getting better at, like they still, I think they're still susceptible to the fungus. So it's just like, I was a really strong bat and I ate a lot. So I lived, but like, will you be able to eat enough the next year? unclear. So it's, it's an ongoing issue, but we are starting there. The surviving bats have at least survived. So we're still trying to figure it out. And they've done some weird experiments where they're like, what if we just have bug buffets before hibernation season? And we bring in a lot of lights outside the cave so that there's like a bug party and then the bats can get really fat and eat as much as they can before they hibernate. So they're doing some interesting experiments like that, that I don't think we know all the results of yet. Is there anything that the average person can do to help with the white nose fungus or is this just a research only and make observations and change for the future? Yeah, so there's a few things that you can think about. One of them is you can like try to support bat research if you're able to like donate to conservation projects, um, things like Bat Conservation International, you can look at the work they're doing and help fund those projects. That's always a great thing to do. If you do any outside exploring, always be careful about the risk of bringing stuff to a new location. So like if you do get really into caving, you should always like wash your shoes between caves. Um, and of course, respecting any like signage and barriers if a cave is like blocked for the safety of the things that live there, don't go into it. If you see other people breaking into things they're not supposed to break into, tell like local wildlife authorities. Um, and of course, always just being a pro bat person, bats still suffer from a lot of negative stereotypes. And so if you ever hear somebody that doesn't like bats or is afraid of bats, it's great to engage in conversation with them and figure out maybe what their concerns or fears are and try to help um, expose them to some new information. Because a lot of people don't realize a lot of the good things that bats can do and how we want to help protect them. Talk a little bit more about some of the negative stereotypes that bats have and give us the factual debunking of these uh, stereotypes. Sure. Um, so one that I think is really relevant right now is that um, some people think that you can get COVID-19 from a bat. And I would like to point out that we have zero, zero confirmed cases of COVID-19 being transmitted from a bat to a person. But bats are not only talked about with COVID-19, they're talked about with Ebola, they talked about with rabies. And like any animal, bats can have viruses and sicknesses. Rabies is definitely something that you can actually get from a bat, and we'll talk about that in a second. But um, Ebola and COVID-19, we have never seen directly transmit from a bat to a person. And in general, because bats are tiny, nocturnal, and in the air, or like otherwise high up, our interactions with bats are incredibly uncommon. Um, you could get rabies from a bat, but you could also get it from a dog or a skunk or a, what's the other guy, raccoons. But 
99% of rabies cases come from dogs because people interact with dogs way more than they do with bats. Um, so those are some things about bats and disease, but understanding bats is gonna help us understand how to fight a lot of diseases. And bats are really, really, really important for reducing a lot of potential viruses too. The insect eating bats are able to reduce insect borne illnesses that you might've heard of like malaria, West Nile, Zika, which have had much more expansive human impacts. Um, and I guess it depends, right? Cause like rabies isn't a big issue in the United States. You're more likely to be crushed by a vending machine. Rabies is a much bigger issue in other parts of the world like Africa, but in Africa, no one's getting rabies from bats. Everyone's getting it from dogs. So perspective, perspective is important. But yeah. So talking a little bit more about bat diversity and uh, size and things. What is the biggest bat versus the smallest bat and where can they be found? Yeah. So the very, very biggest bats have like a six foot wingspan, which is bigger than my wingspan. And they can be found in the Philippines. That is the golden crowned flying fox. And they are a fruit eating bat. And on the list of why bats are really good and awesome, all the fruit eating bats are really important seed dispersers. They eat the fruit, they poop the seeds, replant the rainforest. We love them. Um, and then the tiniest bats are called bumblebee bats. It's kind of a fun name. They're also called Kitty's hognosed bat. And that bat lives in Thailand. And they're not the most well researched. It's actually one of the very few bats we do not have in the Field Museum. If anybody has a specimen of a Kitty's hognosed bat and you don't know where you want to store it, I'm just saying it's one of the only bats we don't have in the collection. What country or state, Anna, has the most diversity in bat species? That's a great question. Um, I am not 100% sure. It might be the Philippines again. It might also not be the Philippines, but it might be. So in general, tropical areas have more bat diversity, um, closer, which you see with a lot of animals. I don't know if you can hear my cat in the background, but she's yelling at me on the floor. Um, but the Philippines has a lot of diversity of rats because there's so many islands and mountains and they do have a lot of bats there. It might not exactly be the most diverse, but there's a lot, a lot of different bats there. So our next question here, do all bats fly at night or, and are nocturnal or do some bats fly during the day or at dawn and dusk? That's a great question. Um, so it kind of goes back to the food and a lot of bats activities are very based on their food. So you do see more variety of activity in fruit eating bats because fruit is not, um, fruit is just fruit. It's just there. It's around. Um, what's cool is that night eating or the night flying insect eating bats, right? They're hunting the things that are out at night. And there's also certain plants like the saguaro cactus that have specialized, have flowers that bloom at night because bats are their pollinators. They're just so fun but usually they are night active. Um, see more daytime activity in fruit bats, generally. So we talked a little bit about hibernating and caves and then leaf litter. Do bats have other diverse ways that they, they call home or how they sleep? So one of the most interesting things that I heard recently is they have found a bat in Japan that like hibernates buried in snow and they're still trying to learn more about it because they like for a while just had these anecdotal stories of like, yeah, I just saw this bat fly out of the snow. Is that normal? And then people were like, I don't know. Is that like, is this like a coincidence or is this like a systemic thing that the bats are doing? Because it was hard to see because they're literally buried in snow. Um, but so they're, they're finding new things all the time about some of the hiding spots of bats. And I don't know, sorry, if you can hear my not bats. I have pigeons that sometimes talk in the background on my camera. But um, they, a lot of them live in trees um, or in caves. And some of them have adapted to live in human structures, whether that is in the eaves of our houses or barns, or sometimes they will take up residence in bat houses that people build on purpose to try to get bats to hang out. So our next question here comes again from Laura. They'd like to know, did the saguaro cactus evolve alongside bats as like a night blooming with the flowers? Yeah, so we see that a lot of pollinator and 
plant relationships seem to be co-evolved. And we see that with the saguaro cactus who has a flower that is designed to attract bats. We see that in some other plants. And one of my favorites is a pitcher plant in Borneo that they've actually studied and it has features that are perfect for the bats echolocation calls. And it has like the maximum acoustic, like, I don't know, sound effects that work really well to bring the bats to it. So this is a plant, it's a carnivorous plant. It looks like a pitcher. That's like what its name is based off of. And it likes to have the bat come and live in it. So the bat will like sleep in there and it will poop in there. And the nitrates in the bat poop is a really good like nutritional bonus for the plant. And it's a really good safe place for the bat to live because nobody's gonna bother it while it's living in a carnivorous plant. And then it like flies away. So they have done different like studies and modification and like this plant has special features that makes it like sound really clear for bats to find it more than any other plant, which is really fun. So you talked a little bit about some uh, mutualistic relationships. So mutualistic relationships are when a relationship between two different species benefit each other. Do you have any examples of mutualistic relationships between bats and other animals or even other plants besides the saguaro and the pitcher plants? Yeah, I'm curious if I can think of any good ones for animals, but they definitely, there's a lot of cute bat and plant connections. And there's a lot of like casual mutualism that I don't know how specifically specified it is evolutionarily, but we talked a little bit about how bats um, that eat fruit are then seed dispersers, and they're a really great seed disperser compared to other animals because they fly really far, so it expands the reach of those plants a lot. So baobab trees or mangoes or bananas, those are all things that are really great for bats. The agave plant is another one that's pollinated by bats, and that's what like humans get tequila from. And that's a thing too, in general, if there's any plants that humans use that benefit from bats, then it also does help humans as another animal. So like humans can thank bats for a lot of things that we use, like agave, which we use to make tequila, or plants that we eat, mangoes, bananas, or just like to look at. Hi, here's this annoying creature. It was not a bat, another bat fan. So my other question for you, Anna, is I've heard that there's a rumor that a bat is actually the fastest mammal on the planet and not a cheetah. Is this true? And how fast does that bat clock in at? That is true, so far as we can measure. So there is a bat. They have measured the speed of the Brazilian free tail bat, and it has been measured going 100 miles an hour, which is faster than a cheetah. So cheetahs have had a long time standing reputation as the fastest mammal, but they are the fastest land mammal. And we do see in general with all sorts of animals, whether they're insects or birds, that it is faster, or even people with our technology, it is faster to travel through the air than on the land. So bats just have that great airtime advantage. Do you have any fun facts of bats that you'd like to share that's your go-to? Oh my gosh. I There's so many things I love about bats. So one of my favorite bats, I just pulled down a picture of it, is these bats, they will actually make a home. They make their own little tents. So you can kind of see these green stripes around them. They're in a leaf that is actually folded over. So they have made careful bite marks along the spine so that the leaf folds down around that spine to like make them a little protective roof. So they're little tent making Honduran white bats, which is very cute. So I like those bats, but there's a lot of great bats. So another popular myth that we have about bats is that they only drink blood. How many species of vampire bats are there really in comparison to other species of bats? That's a great question. So out of over 1,400 species of bats, only three are vampire bats. So it is not a lot. It is a vast minority, but they're cool. They're also some really good sharers. A lot of animals do not like to share food, especially with things that are, or like other animals that are not related to them. Usually if animals share food is with relatives, but in vampire bats, we do see sharing with relatives. We also see sharing with like strangers and friends. And we see like mutualistic friendships that are based off of reciprocal food sharing. 
because blood is one of the hardest like foods to store. So you can starve very easily to death if you like miss a night of eating blood. But if you have a buddy who will regurgitate blood into your mouth for you, then you get to live to have another baddie day. So that's pretty cool. They're often studied for this like interesting friendship exchange. We have another uh, question from our audience here. Are there other superlative bats like besides faster? Are there other record breaking bat facts? That is a great question. I am a pondering. Because we did talk about the biggest of the bats, but that's not the biggest mammal. And I think they're like question, there, there's some small mammals. The smallest bat is, I think, it's kind of contestable depending on like how you measure the smallest mammal, if you do it by like size or mass or volume. But the smallest bat is among the smallest mammals. And it like is, I think it weighs as much as a penny or so. So that's, again, that bumblebee bat is very small. What are other superlative bats? I can't think of any like extreme bat facts. If you know any, you can tell us in the chat, Laura, because I might've missed something. Do all bats use echolocation or do some bats actually have very good vision? That's a great question. So no bats are blind. Um, that's a common saying, blind is a bat. That's throw that away. Their eyeballs work. But if you are hunting insects in the dark, echolocation is a great superpower to like hunt effectively and with great precision. But some bats use their eyes way more because if you've ever been listening for your fruit in the grocery store, you may have realized that makes no sense. And fruit is not very talkative. So bats that eat fruit use their eyes and they do not have echolocation. There is an exception though. There's one fruit bat that lives in caves that uses tongue click based echolocation. So they like lost their sense of echolocation and then re-evolved it in a different way, which is pretty cool. Um, but the fruit bats in general don't echolocate. Thanks, Anna. And I think we have time for one more uh, fun bat fact or anything else about bats that you'd like to share with our audience. Oh, wow. What is the most important bat fact to leave everybody with today. I think one of the most lovely things about bats is that they are so small, but able to live so long. So if you think about having a pet mouse or rat or hamster, usually small mammals have a relatively short lifespan, like around three years is like a fine age. But there are bats, precious tiny bats in the wild that we have seen live over 40 years. And that's amazing. They have the greatest longevity for size of animals. So like the secret to like long life, you know, it might not be something we're able to figure out from the tortoises or the parrots who are also very like long lived animals. I think if you wanna live forever, we have, or a long time, we should be studying more about the bats because they live a very long time, especially for their high metabolism and like body size, the secrets of long life are somewhere hiding in bats. So I think you should definitely look into that. Thanks, Anna. And thanks everyone for joining us today for Beyond the Adventures as we talk about bats. Thanks everybody. 